Right now, in the aftermath of yet another mass shooting, we ask what should and can be done here. What would smart gun policy actually look like? Our power panel puts their heads together in hopes of reaching a workable solution. And next, two former defense secretaries say this president mishandled the serious situation. And you know what? They served for this president. What would have been a better way if Obama had to do it over again? And later, the Pope says, the Pope, that it's time for the church to find a new balance. And during his first extensive interview of his papacy, he criticized the church's focus on gays and abortion. Heaven forbid, is this Pope a progressive? Good evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Thank you so much for joining us this Thursday evening, September 19th. Three days. It has been three days here since the shootings at the Washington Navy Yard, and still, there are a lot more questions about what happened than answers. And the same happened, as we all remember, with Newtown, which was nine months after that deadly day in Connecticut. Well, tonight, we will focus on what we can and should do to make these mass shootings, this is at least we can agree on this, I hope, in this country, the last ones we have to report here on the program. And while that probably won't be the case, hopefully we can agree we can do better than we are doing now. But first, let's start with the very latest from Monday's shootings and the investigation. And for all of that, let's bring in our own Andrew Whitman. Well, Rich, employees returned to the Navy Yard for the first time today since Monday's shootings. This is officials work to learn what they can about the mass murderer, Aaron Alexis. It was back to near normal today at the Navy Yard. Employees returned to work for the first time since Monday's tragedy, but grief hung in the air. I'm kind of apprehensive to see how things go. It's going to be a new norm. It's going to be very difficult for a lot of people. Today, the FBI provided new details about how Monday's shooting transpired. Director James Comey said that Aaron Alexis entered Building 197, seen here in video shot yesterday and provided by the Navy. Alexis was carrying a bag and went to a fourth floor bathroom. He came out with a Remington 870 shotgun and started firing almost immediately and at random. Alexis eventually ran out of ammo and began using a gun he had taken from a Navy Yard security guard. We're also learning more about a chilling encounter an Alabama family says they believe they had with Alexis last month. Glinda Boyd told ABC News she was with her family at the Norfolk, Virginia airport on August 4th when her 75-year-old aunt laughed loudly at a joke. Out of nowhere, a man who looked like Alexis accused them of laughing at him. He was point blank in our face, like two feet. He was in our face and he was going off. He was loud. Investigators are still looking into possible clues that Alexis left on his weapon. He carved the words better off this way and my ELF weapon on the stock of the shotgun he used in Monday's massacre. As Alexis was able to move the yard building for 30 minutes before he encountered any armed responders. He died after a shootout with police. Rich. Andrew, thank you very much. Now, last night we opened up the phone lines uh, to you and we got some real honest dialogue um, about what can should be done about it. And to suffice to say, good and all honest people can disagree on what the Second Amendment does, doesn't allow, what our policy should and shouldn't be, what restrictions are or aren't necessary. I accept all that, but hopefully we can all agree that this systematic cyclical thing of mass shootings in rural, suburban, urban areas, uh, people of all color holding the gun, but the one commonality is troubled person, tragedy, innocent people who don't go home that night. So if we agree that as a nation we can do better than that, let's bring in our panel right now to say how. And we've got a terrific panel this evening. Let's start with Tom Doherty, partner at Mercury, former advisor to New York Governor George Pataki, Dominic Carter, of course, political journalist, author, New York Assemblywoman Shelley Mayer, Democrat out of Yonkers, Chris Shays, former Connecticut Congressman and distinguished fellow in public service at the University of New Haven, and Andrew Whitman, senior po political correspondent who you already met. And Tom, we've gone back and forth, and while people say, oh, it's assault weapons bans, it's background checks, it's, uh, you know, the ammo clips, it's all those different things. If there was one way that we could say as a country that we're going to mm -hmm. try and get the number of these shootings down and the total deaths, deaths by gun, we want to cut it in half by five years from now, what would be the best way to do it? The, the correlation between mental illness, those that we know are on, who have mental illness, who have been treated for mental illness, and the, uh, their ability to have and retain a weapon. I mean, in the cases of Newtown, 
We clearly had a very disturbed individual. We clearly, in this case, had a disturbed individual who just recently had been to a number of doctors, was on medication. Why they're able to hold on to their weapon is ridiculous. So it goes to my background checkpoint, is where I, I differ with some of my Republican friends, is that when you're going through a background check, or, or you're going, you should go through a background check, if you're on any type of medication for mental illness, that should disqualify you. That would save us a lot of time and trouble because the debate over guns, as you know, we're not taking away people's guns. The gun yeah. that he had wouldn't have been banned by the president. So let's start with things that we can agree on. I think that people with mental illness should not have weapons. Tom? I, I, I would love to agree with Tom, but Richard, it's a slippery slope. How do you then define mental illness? Does mild depression fall into that? I mean, many Americans... Uh, suffer from mild depression. And you shouldn't have a gun. And but if, you, if you're on if you're on Prozac, if you're on any type, and of you the, think that that's going to fly with the NRA? Listen, I think that you have to stand above and not worry about what the NRA thinks. Is that the NRA is smart enough? Would you like to? Uh, I, I love you, Tom. I'll, I'll argue would you like to call them? your buddies and tell them that? And watch it. Listen, listen. I would. I've said it on this show consistently. I think that there's a reasonable way to go about this. People who have a mental illness should not have a weapon. End of story. So You're, all mental illness. Well, I mean, again, we have to we, I'm, have, I'm we, we have to either say we're interested in saving lives or not. We all uh, are. Then we have to fight for right and wrong, okay? Mm -hmm. If you have a mm -hmm. mental illness you sh and you're on medication, it shouldn't be like somebody thinks you have a mental illness. Are you taking medication for mental illness? Right. If you're taking medication, you shouldn't be in hold of a weapon. I agree with them. I really do. But I just don't think that would fly. Uh, I guess... Uh, my idea, Richard, you're going to say you wanted something with Congress, but my idea, I really believe a public relations campaign by victims aimed at the NRA, I mean a real campaign, like the like the folks in uh, in Connecticut, a consistent campaign We've seen is it a work start. before. We've seen it work with NAD. Uh, you've seen it in the smoking campaigns. But Dominic, uh, to me, there's no more powerful imagery than seeing those tiny little white coffins. Mm -hmm. And if that couldn't shock the yeah. national conscience, mm -hmm. I don't know that any Madison Avenue campaign is going to get it done. I'd like to think you're right, but the public already voted. 90% of them believe in the background checks, and we still couldn't get it passed. Um, you know, Andrew, you made points before that it comes down to the gun as much as people don't want to, uh, you know, say it does. That It's about the guns. It's about the proliferation of weapons, and until you deal with that, you're not really dealing with the problem. Well, yeah, I mean, we... You, you, you can never tell when somebody's going to snap, when somebody's going to go off the edge, but what we can do is limit how deadly they can be when they do. The only way to do that is to limit the number of guns that are out there, or to at least reduce the number of guns or make it more difficult to get them. It's just going to be that simple. Has the horse left the barn on that one, Congressman? We've got well, more buns, guns than Americans. We have a huge number of guns, but you, you, the Congress would tend to do what's easiest, and believe it or not, the assault weapon ban is easier than doing something more substantive, but the more substantive thing uh, is the background checks and the shows to make sure uh, these so-called shows are a way to just feed weapons in mass to people. Is it dirty secret though with the background checks that it's great if the state's going to do it, but if all 50 states don't opt in, it's really not, the database isn't worth it because as we saw over here, the guy could have gotten, Alexis could have actually gotten an AR-15 if he was a Virginia resident. Right. He wasn't allowed to because he didn't live in state. Well, well, you but know what? You doesn't keep, matter what would have shown up. It, you don't keep, you have to have these bad news to be keep, comprehensive? You keep isolating uh, those states that won't do it, uh, and you just keep you know tightening up. People have a right to have weapons, guns, and the government has the responsibility to regulate that right. They absolutely have the, the responsibility, but it's got to be sensible things. When we get rid of the assault weapon ban, gun owners say, "What a joke! A semi-automatic. It's not an assault weapon. It does the same thing." And then we want people who want gun control because to protect their families to think we've done something. So let's do substantive things. It's what it's what was just said. Privately, in a cloakroom, when when people say, "Listen, if I do this vote here, I'm going to get primaried. I'm probably going to be out of a job." How do you how do you make it so it's a votable? How can they vote? Is it well? Is it just, uh, sweeten just, the deals? How do you get? Well, that? first I'll say. In, in 93, I was the point person on the Republican side for the assault weapon yep. ban. There were some members west of the Mississippi that were literally sweating because they wanted to vote for some of what we were doing. But they knew, I mean, you know, they, the, the people have their guns on their, not on their mantelpiece, they have on the back of their truck across the window, and their kids learn to use guns at age four. Um, 
I think the way you do it is you just talk substantive. I think there needs to be more interaction with NRA folks. I think people or advocates need to be smarter about this. And but when a newspaper prints who owns guns, yeah. mm -hmm. that is very destructive. Yeah, mm -hmm. I thought it's funny then that for people who don't remember, was uh, the Journal News, a uh, paper um, of record in the Westchester Rockland area, it became a national story, and, and for many people, it articulated their fears that there was going to be basically outing of gun owners and a demonization of them, and, and that I think really turned a lot of this debate. As somebody went in New York, you guys. Um, did one of the most comprehensive uh, pieces of legislation that actually passed through and Republicans voted with you. Absolutely. Um, what's worked out of it, and then if we're honest, what really hasn't materialized like you guys had hoped he since it's passed? Because you're always honest. That's right. Thank you. Uh, no, I think uh, the bill has worked, and, and, and credit to Governor Cuomo. This was not an easy thing to do. He pushed it through in January uh, because the time was right, and had he waited any longer, and this is where I think the point about political organizing is key, frankly, we would have been out-organized because m members would, Republican members, particularly from Western New York and Central New York, would have been reluctant to vote for it because they would have been fearful of a primary. By doing it quickly, basically before they got organized, uh, we were able to have a bipartisan bill it wasn't perfect. We went too fast. There were mistakes in it. It's Some the of them seven we had, bullet clip the seven bullet, was, but yeah. we went back and fixed it. We fixed it on a bipartisan basis later in the year. But you know, a limitation on the clips, limitation on the kinds of guns, uh, requiring registration of assault weapons, and ultimately they won't be you won't be able to buy them in New York. Uh, I think the background check is absolutely key. I think the rubber meets the road when you define mental illness. And that's really where we're going to have a sticking point here is how are we going to define who is mentally ill? Also, isn't the dirty secret, okay, fine, you define it, but as we're learning more and more, where's the money to treat all these people? I mean, I, that, I'm not trying to make the problem even harder here, but if you say, okay, this person's trouble, let's say Alexis, after the Newport police reported it to right. the Navy, what do you do with them? Um, and then, you know, but I'm talking to mental health. That's, what we, that's where we need to, that's, those are the folks who need the attention if you don't want these murders. It's not the assault weapon ban. Yeah. But, but can I just add that in New York, there is an interplay between the mental health community plus an, uh, money was put into the mental health system. And then there's an interplay between mental health professionals uh, at a certain point determining whether their patient owns a gun and then reporting it. And, it was fraught, it's fraught with danger, but it's a, it is an effective way to start to address it at a statewide level. And I, look, it wasn't popular in my, in my district, but it was the right thing to do. Um, Andrew, we go across the river in New Jersey, and one of the more popular political figures, um, Chris Christie, um, who's got a 70% approval rate mm -hmm. or something approaching that in a wow. state with more registered Democrats wow. than Republicans, um, he, um, is going to have to wrestle with this issue, and already is, especially if he's got any uh, prospects nationally in 2016. Well, the wrestling, I, I think, is uh, is over, Rich. As you were talking to the Assemblywoman about uh, New York's new tough gun laws, Connecticut passing gun laws as well, Governor Christie in New Jersey vetoed three different gun bills. One put gun permits on driver's licenses, making gun training mandatory, expanded background checks. 82% support in the state vetoed. Wow. Another about better reporting of lost and stolen guns, 85% support vetoed. But the one that I find hard to get is the ban of the 50 caliber Barrett rifle. The Barrett is a military sniper rifle that can kill from a mile or further away a mile. And even the ammo is stupid scary. It's nearly five and a half inches long. It dwarfs just about anything else that's out there. And oh my goodness, the damage these things can do.